minimum inspection requirements as possible. Um, they'll tell you up front what their methods are going to be and how often they're going to come in so you can prepare for them. They may choose to do interim um, inspections. We'll let you know if an improper inspection is in a second, and then um, incompetent inspection. So let's just talk about minimum inspection requirements. So at a minimum, you've got to come in and ensure whether you're using the correct uh, types, kinds, and quantity of supplies to make your product. You have to document any changes or deviations from the contract requirements. So if any of those exist, any, in other words, you and the government agree that these specs, and then you realize your machine couldn't provide that one particular spec, you have to get agreement with the government to change that spec. You can't just produce at the level you can produce and assume all as well. You're also, they're also checking to make sure the product operates in it as intended. So it's one thing if you deliver five computers and they turn them each on and make sure that they work and load properly. If you deliver a thousand, chances are the government's gonna, not going to check every one of the thousand. So that's where they start getting themselves in trouble. Um, if there are any signs of spoilage or age deterioration, so remember what they, um, uh, the movie, we talked about war dogs, and I told you um, about the guy who actually worked that. He was the contracting officer representative. He said that you know some of the nail, the bullets were were rusting, and they were rusting through the plastic bags, and there were some indications that there were problems um, in terms of that. Uh, the, the item is properly identified, and marked, and that appropriate packaging was required. So sometimes it's not just the actual product, but you know how did you send it over to us? Did, did you meet all the requirements for packing and inspection? Because sometimes you don't know where your stuff is going to end up, right? So if you're delivering it from your building to a government facility down the road, you know, that's that's one form of transport. But if you're delivering to a Air Force base that's going to be sent overseas some point and dro air drop down, they're going to put more stringent packing requirements on you. So they, they'll check that as part of the inspection as well. <coughs> In terms of methods and occurrences, um, sometimes they just do a sensory check. So if there was a smelling feature, the girlfriend would not be able to uh, participate in this activity. Um, so things like sight, hearing, and touch. So they can get a sense of, okay, I'm looking at this thing and it looks like something's missing, and I can tell you that. Or it's, I'm turning it on and it's vibrating and it sounds like it's going to blow up. That's probably not a good sign either. Any kind of surface defects, it's dinged on the side. Um, parts that may be out of alignment, well the computer's in great shape except you know it's attached to the keyboard and it's over here as opposed to where it should be. So those are the kind of things that they're looking for in terms of sensory or dimensional checks. Um, there's also uh, performance or physical tests where they actually either put data onto your system to see how it processes or um, they test it in other ways so they can see if it Performance as opposed to as part of the contract. So that's the performance type check. Sometimes they have destructive tests uh, where they simulate abuse until the item is destroyed to see if it can withstand a certain set level of stress. So if we're talking about computers being airdropped, you know, you have to package them in a the correct way and um, the, the government may take it up in a plane and drop it and see how if it lands and still can be used. Um, in this case, there's uh, no government inspection. The contractor's required to perform all inspections and testing. So they might say to you, you need to test that it's going to be able to drop from 3,800 feet. Why do they want you to do it? Because you're bearing the responsibility of cost for the item you're going to destroy. Right? They don't want to accept it and then pay for it. So. Um, they have to evaluate all the procured items. Uh, they could also do random or spot checking, if you were talking about. Or they could do some sort of statistical sampling, where they um, take a representative um, subset of the procured items. So if you think about all the items you procure, and um, maybe you procure them in three different locations, what should happen is there should be an equivalent number of samples from each of your three different factors so that they can ensure that you're following the same following process across the board. They can also have interim uh, inspections where um, 
They can't delay your work. This is where they would pick something out of a bin to test it. It can be used to determine if on schedule performance can be expected. So there was one case where the government said, I don't know what the change was, maybe, you know, you painted all these blue, we wanted them all painted pink. And so they kept asking the contractor, how many of you have you repainted to be pink? And the contractor kept saying, oh, I got 10% done, I got 20% done, and they just kept reporting numbers bigger and bigger. And the government decided to provide a surprise inspection, and guess what, they were all blue. So right there and then, the contractor committed fraud because they lied to the government in these status reports. So that's the kind of stuff they're checking there. They want to make sure resources are being applied um, as originally, at originally predicted levels. So, um, you know, if they're uh, testing, um, the example I was thinking about is when they come in to do a live test demonstration, if they're testing, they load data onto this computer, they check where all the wires in this room are going because they want to make sure that what they're actually testing is this computer that you proposed. They want to make sure it's not that a wire from this computer is attached to a Cray computer in another room that has a whole lot of processing power, and that's why they're getting such fast speeds. So they're verifying that what you proposed is what's actually being tested. The quality of the end product is consistent with the requirement. Well, that makes sense. Progress payments were warranted. So if you say to the government, um, the government says, okay, I need 1,000 in two weeks, and they come in at the week mark, and um, they see that you haven't purchased anything yet. So it looks like you're not going to make the delivery. Why did I pay you all this money up front in terms of a progress payment if you didn't get anything done? Um, new components need to be incorporated into major systems. That's another example of why. So in the case where the product is bouncing back and forth between the government and contractor to add these additional components, that might be another reason to do inspection. Or if they decide your own inspection system is inadequate. So, you know, let's say they uh, go to a, one of your companies, they look at your inspection records, and they're like, well, you really haven't followed this consistently. You've had 10,000 work orders, and you've only filled this out on 5,000 of them. They would consider that inadequate. All these inspection people come from Washington, D.C. <laughs> the root of all evil. <laughs> No, what you'll find is two different initiatives. One is that the government tries to locate government facilities outside of Washington, D.C., because things are crazy in Washington, D.C., so they try to spread the government around the country. And then the second thing you're finding is that this whole notion of um, telework, so the government can reduce its footprint, um, so they're trying to keep keep more and more people home doing their jobs as opposed to coming into an office, so they can be located anywhere. So you'll see a lot of jobs now that even though the work location might be Washington, D.C., telework is available so people can live in Honolulu and do a job. So depending on what, what the requirement is. An improper inspection are things like this. You know, I told you that you had to, that you had a 5% uh, variation, plus or minus, in the contract, but now that I'm here, I want you to stick within 2.5%. So putting a stricter standard, that would be an improper inspection. Do not reasonably measure whether the contract items conform to the specified requirements. So, um, you know, if you, if, if we have a whole list of acceptance criteria, and I come in and say, okay, you were supposed to provide five, and here are five, okay, done. That's an improper inspection, because I said there's going to be this whole list of things that I'm going to inspect for, and I didn't look at any of those things. Um, if every day I come in to do an inspection and I look at different things, that's an improper inspection. I have to stick with what's in the contract, come and inspect those each and every time so I can see if there's any fluctuation in your performance. And then if, if I do anything in my inspection that results in unnecessary delay or um, if it's unreasonable in terms of time to get things done, maybe you Maybe you put your factories on automatic through the night, and the one particular widget is produced during the night. So if I said I wanted to conduct an inspection during the night, one of your people would have to come in and meet me to be able to do that. That's probably unreasonable. So whatever your normal routine is. Unusual 
um, or incompetent inspection. Any test used to overturn the results of another test is considered an unusual test, and it could result in government negligence. So um, if that government negligence causes any financial burden to the contractor, you're, you're eligible to get reimbursement for that. I'm sorry these topics aren't very exciting. I feel like they're all sort of... <laughs> I'd rather you know about this stuff going into it so that you can be prepared in case you're ever, or that you can know these clauses and know what they're looking for. Um, the government documents inspection, so they have an official procedure for what how their inspection reports look, um, and then they have to communicate with you. So you get a letter or a memo or a report that basically says the item conforms to the contract specification, or it shows minor nonconformance, or it does not conform, but it can be made to conform, or it's hopeless. It doesn't conform, there's no way it's going to get there. And so based on the answer to this, depends on how much rework drives how much rework you have to do. So all supplies and services should be accepted when they conform to contract requirements. Other things they can look at are um, whether or not to accept. Is, is it non-conforming? When did you actually secure acceptance? Okay, so I came in on Monday to, uh, for the scheduled inspection, but your products didn't conform, and so I, I couldn't come back. For, I, I came back a month later, and that's when acceptance was actually deemed. So they have to document that because that's going to drive them to an invoice. The point of acceptance, when ownership was transferred. So sometimes you, they conduct inspections at their own facility. Who has title of the product at that point? Typically, it's FOB origin or FOB destination. So if it's from the time it leaves your plant, that's FOB origin. That means that the government is responsible for the transportation and delivery to their facility. If it's FOB destination, you retain title until it shows up at the government facility. And so that drives acceptance. And then um, non-conformance is determined when the contractor presents a deliverable to the government that does not strictly conform to the contractor's requirements. So keep in mind, we're talking, everything we've talked about so far has been this manufacturing process, because that's where you are. But it's also deliverables like status reports. They go through a similar type process. Obviously, they don't do a destruction test burn it up right in front of your rear nose, but they do check it to make sure. Um, sometimes we have minor nonconformities and they can be accepted as is. Um, when the savings realized by the contractor does not exceed the cost of the government for processing a formal modification. So let's say, for example, um, this word Sharpie is written in cursive. But let's say when we actually printed these pens, it was written in block lettering. So does the pen still open and close like it should? Um, is the outside the same color as the ink inside? Uh, does anybody really care if uh, Sharpie is written in block letters or? Uh, <laughs> Sharpie probably cares. But as far as the government, they could accept this as a non-conformance, right? Because it doesn't meet the specs. But maybe they, um, if we were, if I was to redo this, it would cost me um, basically all the, I would have to produce this whole piece again, right? And so it's going to be a lot of expense to me. And not only that, but for you, the government, you're going to have to produce a contract modification. And quite frankly, other than Judy, the rest of us really won't give a damn whether it's in block or. <laughs> so that's what non-performance. Uh, so if it doesn't, adversely affect the health and safety of the product user. I'm not in pain if it's written in block or so sharp uh, person. Reliability, durability, or performance. You know, it still writes the way I expect it to write. Interchangeability of parts or assembly. This part still fits. We're good. And any other basic objective of the contract is met. I need it to be able to mark on paper, and it still marks on paper, so I'm good to go. Um, in cases of minor non-conformance, the government could just accept this and just say it's fine. You know, we both know it's wrong, but I'll accept it. Um, so that's the case here. But keep in mind that just because I've accepted it with block letters this one time, 
doesn't mean I'm going to do that in the future. So you get your act together and make sure it gets fixed for next time around. Any questions about any of that? Anybody care about any of that? <laughs> Couple other issues. Um, now let's say that it's really non-conforming. Like it's uh, a red outside and green ink. Okay, so that's totally non-conforming. Now they have to do a modification to the current contract, and the government has to obtain an equitable reduction in price, or the contractor offers the government another type of adjustment, such as additional end units. So let's say, for example, um, you say, okay, um, I understand that you put red ink in this pen, and I'm not happy about the red ink in this pen, uh, so what I would like is, um, if, you, if you give me an extra 50 pens, the correct pens, I will use these internally and use those 50 pens for outside use because I know that there's a problem. And, um, so they could do something like that. Or they could say, nope, not going to accept it all. Give me brand new ones that are correct. And that's on your level. Um, in terms of the time allowed for acceptance, after the delivery is made, there's got to be a reasonable period of time where I can actually fix this problem. So normally like 30 days for most things. Um, and then the government comes back in to do acceptance or rejection again. Um, the other thing is that while the government, like I might say I need 30 days to fix it, you give me 30 days to fix it, but that doesn't mean on day 31 you're going to show up, right? Because you have your own schedules and yet that could be, you might not come see me for like another week and a half. So I'm at risk because I'm not sure if my new product is going to meet all your specifications, but that's on me to make sure it's right. Now we talk about the government acceptance is implied when the government's conduct um, implies that it's been accepted. So um, let's say you turn over the product and you, you give the government an acceptance document and they don't sign it. And so you don't have any actual acceptance. But you go into the government facility and you see they're using all these green pens. That's implied acceptance. So even though they haven't formally accepted it, they've implied acceptance by using your product. Or if the government delays in making a formal statement about acceptance or rejection. So if they, you know, if you turn your products over and you give them, you know, five or ten days and you haven't gotten anything back, you can still invoice because you're assuming that you've gotten acceptance. And they haven't said all the laws because they've delayed, so that's on them. I always like to see how far we have to go. <laughs> um, the contract determines where the items will be accepted. So it could be at our plant, it could be at a prescribed destination point or it could be any other location that you previously agreed to, but all that's in your original contract. Uh, we talked about transfer of ownership. It could be significant if damage or loss were to occur when the items were being shipped from contractor's plant to the government destination. Anybody know what this is? iPhone. <laughs> you know what is this? This is an act taken prior to coffee. I got up at 5.30 this morning. <laughs> Put these slides together. <laughs> Coffee did not happen until 6 o'clock. The results. <laughs> well, cost all your tea. <laughs> That's right. In the chapter, it talks about quality. Hi. How ironic. <laughs> um, okay, so this is that whole FOB origin or FOB destination and who has responsibility for damage. So in the case of FOB origin, the government would be um, liable for any damage or loss during transport in FOB destination, meaning once the product gets here, so it means the contractor's responsible. One little easy way to remember that is who's paying for it. The one paying for it is the one responsible for it. Like if you're paying for the freight, if it's mm -hmm. FOB destination, then you would be responsible for it, the, for the contractor. It's, 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 I, I didn't realize that's, that's true. true. the origin. It's, it's, it's the origin, yes. Uh, who, well, whoever pays for the transportation is the one responsible for getting it for. Um, yeah, but I would have thought 
Doesn't the co uh, contractor always have to pay for transportation? Yeah. Yeah. Really? Yeah. DLA has gone to every.